It was one night in historic Hyde Park, New York, that a group of National Park Rangers gathered about a fire to discuss what has been done to preserve our shared wonderland of beauty, our sites of cultural significance, and our national heritage. Welcome to another Fireside Chat video. What you thinking about, Ranger Lydia? How the traditional name for the star Beetlejuice is derived from the Arabic meaning armpit of Orion, and that when stars dim, sometimes that's a precursor to a supernova. How about you, Ranger Will? Oh, I don't know. Fireside chats, I guess. How about you, Ranger Alexi? I just keep thinking about how significant of an impact the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration had on the National Park Service and the American people's relationship with their public resources. True, FDR's first New Deal greatly expanded the scope of the National Park Service. After restructuring in 1933, the system would include all federally controlled national parks and memorials and national monuments and the capital parks, as well as national military sites such as historic battlefields. See what I mean? And uh, during the Second New Deal, they made a policy of preserving sites of national historic significance. Yeah, let's not forget, FDR is directly responsible for the establishment of some of our earliest national historic sites. We work at two of them. What's the matter, Sparky? You hungry? I wish we could tour some of those National Park Service sites now. Why can't we? Come on, my friends, to the green and gray screen. You know what this means. Uh, witches? Arthur Miller? Nathaniel Hawthorne. He was from Salem. Established March 17th, 1938. The first National Historic Site in U.S. history? Ah, Salem Maritime. Yes, exactly. Salem Maritime National Historic Site consists of nine acres of land and 12 historic structures along the Salem waterfront. There's also a downtown visitor center and a fascinating replica tall ship. Wow, I love a good visitor center. This park interprets and preserves over 600 years of maritime history. Let's check it out. This isn't it. Hold on, let me try. My turn. Are we there yet? Get along, little doggy, get along. Go on, get. Go on, get. For settlers struggling along the nearby Oregon Trail, the Whitman Mission was a refuge. Yet, for the Cayuse, the founding of this mission in 1836 was a prelude to tragedy, invasion by disruptive and destructive foreigners, pestilence, and ultimately, war. Missionaries Marcus and Narcissa Whitman were killed here, along with 11 others, in 1847 an event that sparked outrage across the United States and played a significant role in Oregon becoming a U.S. territory. Incidents that occurred at this historic mission remain controversial today. 
But here I can stroll along Oregon trail ruts, visit graves, see remnants of historic mission buildings, and gain a broader understanding of the complex nature of westward expansion, the pain that shapes nations, and the conflicts that often arise when different cultures collide. It makes sense that Perry's victory was established during FDR's administration in 1936. He has a lasting passion for all things naval, in particular the War of 1812 and its history. Fra Franklin Roosevelt actually had depictions of Admiral Perry in his art collection. There you are! Wait a minute. Where are we? In Ohio, along the scenic Lake Erie at Perry's Victory National Monument, the only international peace memorial in the U.S. National Park System. It's the largest Doric column in the world, 352 feet tall. It's 47 feet tall in the Statue of Liberty there. And we're five miles from the longest undefended border in the world at a place that celebrates lasting peace between the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. The monument commemorates the Battle of Lake Erie. The hero of Lake Erie, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, isn't laid to rest here. But six naval officers, three British and three American, are laid to rest under the rotunda. What are we doing now? We're exploring one of Utah's mighty five national parks. It has folding layers of golden sandstone, a fascinating desert climate, world-class canyoneering, and historic orchards. The works! Oh right, Capitol Reef, originally established as a national monument during FDR's second term. And don't forget the gold tier internationally certified dark sky park. The heavens unfold before you into a blanket of stars at night. This isn't going to work. There are too many parks. We need to split up to cover more ground. No. <laughs> Let's regroup at a time that's more convenient for plot and editing. Trust me, we know this is absurd. Saratoga National Historic Park preserves the location of two pivotal battles during the American Revolution. The Continental Army's success here was the first major victory of the war. It boosted morale, turned the tide of the conflict, and secured a critical alliance with France. Visiting here lets me immerse myself into the battle through 10 exhibit and wayside tour stops. I love a good wayside. North of the battlefield, I can...
Take a tour of the restored country estate of the American General Philip Schuyler. It was burned during the British retreat. Stroll through Victory Woods, where the British encampment was surrounded. And climb an obelisk monument that commemorates the American victory. It was the first surrender of a British army in the history of the world. George Washington Carver was so much more than just peanuts. He was a renowned agricultural scientist, an innovative educator, and a dedicated humanitarian. Established on January 5, 1943, George Washington Carver National Monument was the first National Park Service site to honor a person of color. And it was also the first National Park Service site dedicated to an individual who wasn't a president. Visiting lets us explore his lasting legacy. See the cabin site where he was born into slavery, walk the ground of his childhood, and learn about his important research in a lab classroom. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt visited Glacier National Park in the summer of 1934 delivering one of his public radio addresses from the Two Medicine Chalet on August 5th. Come on, this is the location of the speech. The speech! There is nothing so American as our national parks. There is nothing so American as our national parks. The fundamental idea behind the parks, in brief, is that the country belongs to the people that it is in the process of making for the enrichment of the lives of us all. The, the park stand as the outward symbol of this great human principle. In the president's words. Today, for the first time in my life, I have seen Glacier Park. Perhaps I can best express to you my thrill and delight by saying that I wish every American, old and young, could have been with me today. The great mountains, the glaciers, the lakes and the trees make me long to stay here for all the rest of the summer. With all the earnestness at my command, I express to you the hope that each and every one of you who can possibly find the means and opportunity for so doing will visit our national parks and use them as they are intended to be used. You will find them in every part of the Union. You will find glorious scenery of every character. You will find every climate. You will perform the double function of enjoying much and learning much. It wasn't a public speech. Only transcripts survive of this informal radio address. That's okay. I have artistic license. FDR had a profound impact on the size, makeup, and mission of the National Park Service. So as of now a clock, there are 423 sites in the National Park Service. Nearly a quarter of those sites were added to the national park system under the Franklin Roosevelt administration. A diverse array of national treasures was brought under the control of the National Park Service and many other new park sites were created. In the same era, New Deal programs created never before seen public access to these various resources. Organizations like the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps brought infrastructure. Roads, bridges, dams, trails, buildings, and more into our national parks. Roosevelt inspired generations of stewards and explorers, as is displayed in his address given at Glacier National Park. It's clear FDR used the prestige of the presidency and the power of his own celebrity to promote the National Park Service. His time in office and charisma fundamentally changed the way that people view and use these resources. I just wish you could have been there, Sparks. 
There are so many different kinds of national park sites, big and small, in city and countryside, in states and territories. There are parkways and preserves and monuments and <sighs> the list is so grand and diverse, just like our nation. I just hope I get a chance to explore it all. You will. I believe in you. You have watched another Fireside Chat brought to you by the National Park Service and the National Historic Sites in Hyde Park, New York. We encourage you to explore the public treasures of these United States. There might be one nearby. And if you're able to find yourself under a dark sky, look up and gaze in wonder. In the words of the 32nd president, may we come better to know every part of our great heritage in the days to come.